Welcome to Pals. It's from Sanya Musa Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you're just joining us or you have not subscribed, we would like you to subscribe now and be part of this amazing anatomy family. We will be discussing gross anatomy of the heart. In this lecture series on the heart, we will describe the various components of the external features of the heart, such as the surfaces, the borders, We'll consider the apex, look at the base, look at the grooves and sulci. We'll also look at the chambers, four of them, look at the valves in between the chambers and the blood vessels. We'll consider arterial blood supply to the heart and finally we'll look at clinical correlates. In this part one, we'll look at the external features of the heart and also consider the right atrial chamber. Part two would be on the rest of the chambers, which will be the left atrial chamber and right and left ventricular chambers. In, a part, in the part 3 of this class, we will look at the arterial blood supply and then the associated clinical correlates. So, no time to waste, let's go to class. Why is today's lecture very important? It is because the heart is the leading cause of death in most countries of the world today. This lecture is going to form a strong foundation that will enable you, as a medical student, to appreciate a number of these diseases and other associated diseases. Some of them include myocardial infarction, which in simple terms is heart attack, angina pectoris, mitral valve prolapse, endocarditis, coronary arteriosclerosis, to mention but a few. The heart is such an interesting organ with so many uniqueness around it. I'll tell you a few. Do you know that the heart starts developing by day 19? And by day 22, it will start beating. And hey, by day 24 and 25, it has already started working, even while it is still not fully developed. It has started pumping blood. You know why? Because the developing fetus cannot survive without the heart functions. The heart is a chemical holomuscular organ that is responsible for circulation. We we'll find it in the middle metastinum and then it is wrapped within the pericardium. Here is the pericardium and within is the heart. Now, one thing that would be good for us to understand from this beginning is to see how it is located within the middle metastinum. In this diagram, we can notice that one, the heart lies behind the sternum, that's the sternum, and then it lies obliquely. Now, it means it's slanted to one side. You can see the slanting to one side and it's pointed to the left. That's the left that's pointing here, pointing to the left. And what's the next thing? One third of the heart is found on the right side. This is the right side of this individual. And here we're seeing just a little part of the heart, about one third. And the remaining part of the heart is lodged towards the left. And that's two third. Here's the two third of the heart lodged around the left part of the thorax. So let's move on. Generally, it's known that the heart is about the owner's clenched fist. So if you clenched yours, you could have a good idea of the size of your heart. Um, the dimension is 12 by 9 cm, as you can see here. And for males, the weight about, has an average weight of about of about 300 grams and then for females we have about 250 grams. Now we have this ABCs of the heart and then that's where I'm going to start because these are the areas we will consider in discussing the external features of the heart. The first of this ABC is called the apex of the heart, the apex. Now we have another part of the heart we'll be considering which is the borders. And then we have the surfaces 
and then finally we'll go and do a lot of work in the chambers. So these are the major areas we'll consider when we're discussing the features of the heart. That's why we call them the A, B, C's of the heart. So let's move on. In the chambers, we have four chambers. Here in this picture, we can see the, the right atrial chamber in this here, the right atrial chamber here. And then we can see part a little bit of the left atrial chamber. We're seeing just a little of it here. And we're seeing the, the largest part we're seeing in this anterior surface. Here is, a, there is the right ventricle. And then the little part we're seeing here is the left ventricle. So we have these four chambers of the heart, the right and left atrial chambers, and then the right and left ventricular chambers. We have these three surfaces. The first is the surface we're looking at here. The surface my light is running on, and we call this surface the anterior surface. And because this surface is the surface relating to the sternum and then the costal cartilages, we also call it the sternocostal surface. We also have this surface that relates with the diaphragm. That's the surface we're finding around here, around this region. So this surface, we call it the diaphragmatic surface or the inferior surface. Why diaphragmatic? Because it is this area that relates with the diaphragm. Now we have the other part of the heart, which is called the posterior surface or the base. This is the part that we see when the heart is viewed from the posterior end. So this makes the three surfaces of the heart, the anterior, the inferior, and the posterior, also known as the base. We will now look at the borders. We will first identify these borders, and then we will take time to look at specific features on the borders. We have four borders. Here we have the right border. The right border is the border we already seen here. This is the right border. And then we also have the inferior border. Here is the inferior border. This is the inferior border. We also have the left border. This is the left border. And then we have the superior border. The superior border is this border running from here to there. So these are the four borders of the heart, superior, inferior, the right, and the left. When we view the heart, we will notice that we have these marked depressions on the external surfaces of the heart. We call these depressions the sulci or grooves. So what do they do? These grooves or sulci will separate different chambers of the heart. We noted here as our right atrial chamber, and we can see a groove here separating the atrium from the ventricle. We can also notice another groove here between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So these grooves are seen on the surface of the heart, both on the anterior surface and also on the posterior surface. The atria are demarcated from the ventricles by the coronary sulcus. So this groove here is called the coronary sulcus or atrioventricular groove. Now, because we also have another atrium on the left side and another ventricle on the left side, so we should know when we are referring to this coronary sulcus and then when we are referring to this other coronary sulcus, the one we, found, we are seeing a little of it here, because we are seeing a little here too. This is a little of it here. So here, we call this sulcus the right coronary sulcus and we call here the left coronary sulcus. Also, on this anterior surface, we noted the groove between the two ventricles. So we call this groove interventricular groove or interventricular sulcus. That is the groove we are looking at here. That is the one we have here. We also have this groove at the posterior surface of the heart. For us to know which interventricular groove we are referring to, we should also 
call this one the anterior interventricular groove and then the one behind the posterior interventricular groove. We will next consider the apex. The apex of the heart is this region we can see here. This is the apex of the heart. It is formed by the inferior lateral part of the left ventricle. And here is the here is the left ventricle. And it is found at the junction of the inferior and left borders of the heart. If you remember, here is the here is the inferior border. And then running down from here is the left border. So we notice that the apex of the heart is found at this junction. And I wouldn't want us to be also confused about this apex because it gives us the impression that we should be seeing it up, but here is actually seen at the lower part of the heart. It is important for us to know the anatomical position of this apex. Now, first, it lies posterior to the fifth intercostal space. It's important for us to note that. Two, it's also about 9 cm from the median plane. What are other peculiar things about this apex? This part will remain motionless throughout the cardiac cycle. It is here the mitral valve sound closure is maximal. And this is called the apex bit. We will start with the surfaces. We will start with the anterior surface. The view we are looking at now is the anterior surface. The anterior surface is the only surface that the four chambers of the heart will be seen. Now, it's made up of the right atrium. This is the right atrium. That's the right atrium. We can see the right ventricle. That's the right ventricle. We can see the atrial ventricular groove or the right coronary sulcus that is here. We can also see a narrow strip of the left ventricle that is here. And then finally, we see a little of the left auricular appendage that is here. So what are the four chambers of the heart that can be seen in this surface? Number one, the right atrium. Number two, the right ventricle. Number three, a little of the left ventricle. Number four, the tip of the auricle of the left atrium, and then these groups, the right coronary sulcus and the anterior interventricular groove. So these are the areas that can be seen on the anterior surface. Now the posterior surface. If we remember, the posterior surface is also called the base of the heart. I will not want any of you to be confused with this base of the heart because we expect the heart to sit on the base, but the heart does not sit on the base. The heart actually sits on the diaphragmatic surface. Which part of the heart forms the base? This region is the base of the heart. This is the region of the base of the heart. That's the region I've marked out. This region forms the base of the heart. Now, it is almost entirely formed by the left atrium. Here is the left atrium. You can see this is the left atrium. And then there's little contribution, little contribution from the right atrium. Now, it receives four pulmonary veins. What are the veins? We have, we have one here, two here, three here, and then four here. And this is the little contribution from the, from the right atrium. In this contribution, we are seeing a little of the superior vena cava and then the inferior vena cava here. It will be important to note the anatomical position of the base. So the base is seen overlying the T6 to T9 thoracic vertebra. Also, we can see it extending from here. Let's look at this point. This is the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk. We can see it extending from here, this point, down to the coronary sac coronary sulcus. This is the coronary sulcus. So the base extends from T6 to T9 thoracic vertebra, which is also 
the point between the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk and the coronary sulcus. We noted earlier that the base also receives six veins. What are these veins? We said the, the two superior pulmonary veins plus the two inferior pulmonary veins and then the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. We will consider the last of the surfaces and that is the diaphragmatic surface. Which area is the diaphragmatic surface? This is the area called the area of the diaphragmatic surface. This is the area that relates with the diaphragm. And this is the area that the heart sits on. The heart sits on the diaphragmatic surface. So this area is flat and rests on the central tendon of the diaphragm. We can see the two ventricular chambers contributing to this surface. Here we see the larger portion being contributed by the left ventricle and we are seeing a smaller portion being contributed by the right ventricle. And then the groove between them here is the posterior interventricular groove. Posterior interventricular groove. The left ventricle actually forms two thirds of this surface and the right ventricle forms only one third of this surface. Let's go to the borders. We noted the right, the left, the superior and inferior borders. We start with the right border. In this image, this is the right border. This is the right border. As we can notice here, it's slightly convex. Look at the, con the curvature. It's slightly convex. That's the curvature. Slightly convex. And it is formed only by the right atrium. This chamber is the right atrium. And then we see it extending between two big veins. Up here is the superior vena cava. And then at this point here, we can see, if we extend it low, we see the opening of the inferior vena cava. That we see the inferior vena cava moving here. We see the, the inferior vena cava there. So we see it extending between two veins. Up is superior vena cava. Down is uh, inferior vena cava, IVC. The extent is from the lower border of the third costal cartilage to the lower border of the sixth costal cartilage. The projection to the right is a little beyond the right margin of the sternum. Remember, this is the little part. It's the right border that projected a little to the right of the right margin of the sternum. We we'll now go to the next border, which is the inferior border. In this image, this is our inferior border. This is the inferior border. And it's nearly horizontal and is formed mainly by the right ventricle. Here is the right ventricle. And then we have a little contribution from the left ventricle here. Now, it is there. remember we saw at this point, we saw the cis costal cartilage last at this point. So here it will run from the cis costal cartilage to its junction, to its junction here with the left border. And where we said is the point of the apex of the heart. So here is the fifth intercostal space. This is the fifth intercostal space. So the extent of the inferior border is between the cis costal cartilage to the fifth intercostal space. And then if you look at the margin, it's about 9 cm from the midline. 9 cm from the midline. If here is the if here is the midline, it will be about 9 cm here from the midline. The left border is curved and it lies oblique. Here is the left border. As you can see here, it's formed mainly by the left ventricle here. And we see a little contribution from the left auricle here. It runs from the apex of the heart here, runs from the apex of the heart here, which we said is at the level of the fifth intercostal space, left fifth intercostal space, and will run up to the left second intercostal cartilage here and this is about 2 cm from the sternum now the superior border here is the superior border now the superior border is formed by the right and left atrial auricles where are the auricles here is the right atrial auricle and then this is the left atrial 
oracle. And they will also see some big vessels between them. What are those big vessels? Here we're seeing the ascending iota. Here we're seeing the superior vena cava. And then here we're seeing the, the pulmonary trunk. So these four structures, right and left auricles of the atria, the superior vena cava, the ascending iota, and the pulmonary trunk will be seen forming the borders. And of course, we know where it's extending. The last point we saw of the right border was at the third coastal cartilage on the right. And then this point of the left border, we saw it at the second left um, coastal cartilage on the left. This border also forms the inferior boundary of the transverse pericardial sinus. We've talked about the transverse pericardial sinus in our lecture on fibrous pericardium. We will start with the chambers of the heart. And we're going to start with the right atrial chamber. Now, here already denoted, already circled out, is the right atrium. It's the part that forms, as we noted earlier, the right border of the heart. It also receives three veins, very important veins. What are those veins? Number one here is superior vena cava. It drains into the right atrium. We have inferior vena cava. It drains into right atrium. And then the superior vena cava is bringing blood from the superior part of the body. Inferior vena cava is bringing all the blood from the inferior part of the body, the part below the heart. Now we see the coronary sinus bringing blood from the rest part of the heart. So the structure we are seeing here is the part of the atrium that is called the auricle. So the auricle of the atrium is an ear-like conical muscular pouch that projects from the atrial chamber. So what this auricle does is to increase the capacity of the atrium. It is seen both on the right atrium and on the left atrium. Here is the, the auricular part of the left atrium. So for each atrium, it has an ear-like projection that is called the auricle. This auricle will overlie the commencement of the aorta and the upper part of the right atrioventricular groove. Let's look at it. We can see the, the auricle here. We can see it covering the, this commencement of the aorta. It's covering part of the beginning of the aorta. And we also see it covering part of the atrioventricular groove here. So with the left auricle here, we we'll see it clasping on this part of the on this part of the right atrium. I'll soon tell you what this part is called. This part is called the infundibulum. So we see the left left auricle of the left atrium and the right auricle of the right atrium clasping on this part of the right ventricle, which is called the infundibulum of the right ventricle. We can also see a groove between the angle of the superior vena cava and the right auricle. This groove will run in this way, will run in this way. This groove will run in this way. Now the name of this groove is called the sulcus terminali. Now this groove that is called sulcus terminali here will make a ridge inside the chamber of the right atrium and that ridge projecting into the chamber of the right atrium will be called the crista terminale. This sulcus terminale is actually very significant because it separates the two major parts of the right atrium and these are the rough parts and the smooth parts. We will go to the interior of the heart. Here is the interior of the right atrium. Here is the interior of the right atrium. The right atrium has been opened from this point, from the point I'm running my, my light, and then reflected to the right. This is the reflection. So from here, we see the interior of the atrium is smooth to the right of the crystal terminale. Now, let me show us the crystal terminale. Now, where 
the line I'm making now is a point of the crystal terminal. This is the crystal terminal. I will notice that this side is the right part of the crystal terminal, and here is the left part of crystal terminal. So by the time we reflect this area, we notice that it will now move towards the left part of the crystal terminal, and this left part is rough, and then this right part is smooth. The rough part of the wall is due to the presence of pectinate muscles. These are the pectinate muscles. You can notice them here. All the small, all the ridges, these are all the pectinate muscles. And they appear as series of horizontal ridges. Now, this rough area represents the true auricular chamber of the embryonic heart. We have discussed the development of the heart in our lecture series on embryology of the heart. And then, please, I will encourage you to grab that lecture and look at how the heart actually developed through all the processes. The remaining part of the atrial cavity, which is a smooth part, represents the area that is formed from the incorporation of the right horn of the sinus venosus. So here, so this rough part represents the true auricular chamber, and then the smooth part represent areas that we have formed from the right horn of the sinus venosus. When we look at the interior of the heart again, we we'll see a number of openings. Now we we'll see the opening of the coronary sinus, the opening of the inferior vena cava, and the opening of the superior vena cava. The opening of the right coronary sinus is a short venous trunk, receiving most of the cardiac veins and it is seen between the right atrioventricular orifice and the inferior venicaval orifice. And this is the opening here. Here, here is the opening of the inferior venicava. Here is the opening of the superior venicava. And then here is the big opening, the atrioventricular orifice, which is opening connecting the right atrium to the right ventricle. Now, in between the opening of the inferior venicaval and then the atrioventricular opening, we see this opening here, which is the opening of the coronary sinus. And that structure we also see here is the interatrial septum. What is the interatrial septum? It is the septum that is formed separating the right atrium from the left atrium. The wall we're seeing here is the interatrial septum. That's the interatrial septum. That is behind this, we see. We see that if I puncture the heart from here, I'll be passing my needle into the left atrium. So this, this wall is shared by both right and left atrium. And here, it forms the posterior wall of the right atrium and will be forming the roof of the left atrium. So the left atrium is attached behind the right atrium, but at a higher level, so it does not extend down to the diaphragmatic surface. Please, it's important we note that. When we also look at the interior of the right atrium, I want us to also note some more structures. We can notice a saucer-shaped depression here. We can see a saucer-shaped depression here. This depression is called the fossa ovale. That's the spell this way. You can see them, the fossa ovale. Now, the fossa ovale lies towards the lower part of this wall. That's the, it lies towards the lower part of the interatrial wall. This depression represents the primary septum of the heart. In the development of the heart, there was a time that there was one common atrial chamber, and then this is the remnant of the first wall that separated the right atrial chamber from the left atrial chamber. Another important structure for us to note in this posterior wall is this upper part of the fossa ovale that is giving us a moon-shaped appearance. This part of the wall is called the limbus. That's the limbus here. These are its spelt, the limbus. Just like the fossa ovale represents the remnant of the primary wall, atrial wall, the limbus represents the lower edge of the secondary septum of the fetal heart. So the, 
the fossil valley is the primary septum of the fetal heart, the limbus is the secondary septum of the fetal heart. Now, in the development of the heart, of course, you would have, if you followed our lecture on the development of the heart, you will notice that at some point, both the primary septum and the secondary septum will fuse. But when they don't fuse, it will lead to a pathological condition which is called the persistent foramen oval. Here is also how it's written. That's persistent foramen oval. This is where we end this part of the lecture. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please drop them in the comments section. The part two of this lecture will be on the remaining part of the chambers. Don't go away. If you consider this material helpful, we encourage you to subscribe, like our video, and share it to your friends that it will also be helpful too. And together, we will build a unique anatomy family where we will make anatomy simple. Make sure I see you in my next video. Bye.